My Old Testament professor once wrote, it is time for Christians to get over the adolescent idea that the main reason to go to church is so that God won't be disappointed. And I remember when I first read this, it was uh, my, my first semester in seminary, it was my first class, I was just weeks into it. And, and I started thinking, you know, maybe I'm carrying with me this adolescent idea that, that the main reason to go to church is so that God won't be disappointed in me. Or, or maybe I go to church so that someone else won't be disappointed in me. Because I remember growing up, there, there was always a rule in my house. And the rule was quite simple. Either you felt well enough to go to church so that you could do your normal Sunday activities, or you didn't feel well enough to go to church and you didn't do your normal Sunday activities. And there was always something I wanted to do around 2.30 in the afternoon, and that was to go play golf. And, and, and so I remember as a, as a little kid, I, I knew, well, I need to go to church. This is a part of the routine. So I won't be disappointed, so God won't be disappointed, and so that I can play golf. And so as I read those words, it is time for us to grow up and to learn that the main reason we go to church is not so that we disappoint God. And, and Dr. Davis goes on the right and, and, and says that the main reason we go to church is so that we praise God. Because we believe in the act of when we praise God, that God takes our praises and that God is blessed by them. And that God blesses us as we praise Him. And in this parable, we find an example of why we go to church. We find the main reason why we go to the church. And Jesus is giving this parable in front of the Pharisees and the elders. Because He wants them to know the reason why we follow God. It's not so that they could stand up and to hold power over one another. Rather, Jesus wants us to know that there is power in praising God. And so this parable begins like it should begin. There's an engagement. The save the date has been sent. Everyone has received their save the date. They've put it on the refrigerator. They know that this wedding is months out. They know that, that they need to go ahead and start planning the calendars. And they've also received that formal invitation in the mail. They, they have taken it out. They have sent in their RSVP. They have, they have gone ahead and started making the arrangements. Because you know when we go to a wedding, there's a lot to do. And, and if you're having to go out of town, you need to find a hotel room. You need to go and try to find the, the, a good gift to be able to give to the, the couple. You need to, uh, to make sure that you have something worthy to wear. So maybe uh, if you've outgrown your suit or if you uh, need a new pretty dress, you go and you prepare. Because weddings invitations are sent out in great advance so that we may prepare for the weddings. And it was custom in ancient Israel to have multiple announcements like we do this day. And it was custom, though, on the day of the wedding that if the person was powerful and if they had servants, that these servants would get up and that they would go personally to each person and they would say, remember, the wedding is today. And they would come with great joy because they had already seen what the, the feast and what the party was going to look like. And, and, and they were getting excited because the, the Israelites know how to do weddings. And, and, you know, we think we know how to do weddings. We, we watch and we see all of these shows about you know, finding the right dress and the right party. But in comparison to them, our attempts at throwing a wedding party, a wedding feast, just pales in comparison. They would party for three whole days. I mean, that's a long weekend in and of itself. To be with friends, to be with family members, to, to be rejoicing over how God has brought these two people together. And so they... The, the servants go out and they're excited. They, they know that they're going to be bringing people in, that they're going to be able to enjoy this feast as they help serve one another. But to their surprise, the people that they have come to say come, they're like, no, no, I think, I think we got something else to do. The, something else has come up. Don't worry about it. And so they return to the king. Now imagine they had to be a little dejected. And, and they said, uh, we're sorry, no one's coming. And the king goes, no, go back out 
and tell them that, that you've seen what I've prepared, that I have the, the choice ox and I have the fat cat. And, and, and I was thinking as I was reading this, we, we have the, the choice pig out there. <laughs> And maybe, you know, we go to weddings and sometimes we judge how good a wedding is by how good the reception is. I don't know. Personally, that's how I, I judge a wedding. I, I enjoy the, the liturgy and I enjoy the sermon, but I'm like, is there good food afterwards? Is there dancing? Is there time to have fun? And so he's like, okay, you've seen this, the king says. Now go and tell them that it's going to be fun, that, that I have all this food prepared. Because for ancient Israelites, they didn't have beef or meat at every meal. It was only on special occasions. And so this is a big deal. And they go, and, and someone looks at him and says, like, oh, oh, no, no, I, I still can't go. I, I have that business to take care of. Or, or no, 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 let's, let's not go there. I, I need to go take care of my farm. It's just, it's too much. Three days? The, th three days is a little exuberant. Let, you don't, don't worry about me. Count me out. And then others for, for some reason, not given. They're so upset that they're asked a second time. And, and I think maybe they feel guilty for backing out on their promise. And so they actually kill these slaves. And they say, get out of here. And the king is enraged. And so he, he starts all-out war. This is not how a wedding day is supposed to go. Or, or maybe some, some families will think, well, there are some fights on wedding days. But everything is prepared, and a war breaks out. And the king, he loves his son greatly. And, and he wants to see his son be in a place where everyone is there, celebrating. And this king is powerful, so it's going to be all of these distinguished guests who are there. And he wanted his son and his bride to be honored with a great celebration. And so he goes at all measures. And he says, go invite anyone. You see those people working on the streets? We don't know their names. Bring them in. Anybody. Right now we need warm bodies in the pews. We need people who can bring life to this party. And I think as we gather at church on Sunday, that we are people who have heard God calling us saying, come, that we have answered the call to be here, that we have answered the call to come and to worship, to follow Jesus Christ. And there is comfort and reassurance in knowing that God has sought out each and every one of us, that each person here, that God has invited to come and to celebrate and to enjoy his wedding feast. Because as the church, we believe that the ultimate wedding is that of Jesus Christ and of the church. That Jesus is the great bridegroom to the church. And that they are brought together. And that it is a covenant that cannot be broken. That will not be broken. That there is no divorce. That there is no argument. There is nothing strong enough to separate Jesus from his church. And so that's why we come on Sunday mornings, in a sense, is to celebrate that God loves us that much, that God sought us out, that maybe we weren't the first choice, but we were chosen by God to be here in this place. And, and, and that is a great message for us as a church to know that, that us who have been called are people now who go out and to call, that we go out and we say, come that there are plenty of spaces available in our community. That you might not think that you're worthy to come to church because of who you are, but you are worthy to come to church because of whose you are. You are created in the image of God, and that is why you are worthy enough to come to the wedding feast. And that's a great story, to know that God ha has chosen each one of us, that God has chosen this place, Point Hope, to be a church that calls people to come and to taste and to see that the Lord is good. And, and, and I love this parable for that fact. But the parable doesn't end there. And that means that we can't end there either. 
that we have a person who wasn't selected by the king to be at this wedding feast. We have someone who's just come off the street, a commoner, and he's standing there without a wedding robe on. And that irritates the king because all of the guests were supposed to wear wedding robes. And, and there was a wedding that I think really captured our country's imagination a few months ago because of what the people wore to the wedding. I don't know if anyone woke up at the crack of dawn to see Will and Kate. I, was there anybody who got up to, to watch the wedding and, as the, the Prince of England married the commoner? And, and I had no clue this was going on. And then all of a sudden, I made a phone call a couple days before the wedding. And I was talking to Christiana, and she's like, have you heard about the wedding? And I'm thinking, uh-oh, did I miss an invitation to go to a wedding? I was like, no. And so she starts telling me, she's like, but this is stupid. We, should, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't watch this wedding. But somehow she got sucked into the frenzy. And so the next thing I know, she's up on Friday morning watching this wedding. And, and I was actually up at the time of the wedding. It was the end of semester and I was trying to finish a paper, but I didn't turn the wedding on. And she knew all about, you know, what they were supposed to wear. They were supposed to wear hats and, and proper attire, and that this was a who's who of weddings. That you, you looked out and you saw, you know, great leaders, and you saw great religious leaders, and you saw politicians and, and business people, and that this was it. And it wasn't only here in America. It was in Britain. It was in Africa. It was everywhere. Because I think we all are captured by a good wedding story, by a good love story of two people coming together, defying all odds and getting married. And so these guests were expected to come clothed in a certain attire, and they did it. And the guests at the wedding that Jesus is mentioning were supposed to wear robes. But in ancient Israel, it was a little bit easier than going out and finding your dress or your hat or your suit, your morning suit, I think, is what they were wearing. But rather, you walked in, and they had already provided a robe for you. As you walked into the wedding, there was your robe. And so you would take off your, your tunic or, or whatever you were wearing, and they would clothe you in this robe that you would wear for the next couple of days. Because Jewish tradition and our tradition believes that the wedding is a foretaste of the ultimate wedding in heaven. So we are to be clothed, and that we are to, be, to as the angels will clothe us in beautiful, sparkling white garments one day when we enter heaven. That here on earth, that we are clothed in sparkling garments here to remember that God wants us to be beautiful and to share the beauty of God's grace. But this guy decided, I don't need to wear a robe. It's not necessary. And for many people, it's not necessary to come to church. It's not necessary to be a part of a religious tradition, that there's other things that are going on. There's business to take care of. There's events that we should go to. There's this and that, that we don't need to be at church. And this parable goes one step further. That even when we have been called to church, that we must remember that the main reason we come to church is not so that the pews we will be filled, but so that we may put on our new robe. Because we believe that God is clothing us in righteousness, in holiness. That as we come to worship, we come with our arms open. And that we ask God on high, to place a new robe on us. We believe that in Jesus Christ there is a new creation. And being clothed in holiness and righteousness is a sign of that new creation. So it is great to be here in this place. But the main reason we come to church is so that we may be clothed by the God who loves us by the God who has a unique and special robe for each and every one of us. That God's closet is bigger than we could ever imagine. That he has them in all sizes and shapes. And so I invite you today, if you've never asked God to clothe you in holiness, 
to clothe you in righteousness, that you take time this day to say, God, I want to be gorgeous and beautiful in your sight. It's not my physical appearance that you're, you're satisfied with. It's being clothed in your son. And Paul writes that we are called to put on Christ. And so this day, we're putting Christ on. And what does that look like? It looks like us embracing love. It looks like us embracing a desire to seek after God in everything we do. That coming to church is not a one-hour event. Coming to church is a 365-day-a-year joyful activity we partake in. That we put on Christ each and every day we wake up. I invite you, when you step out of bed tomorrow, to say, God, clothe me in your glorious righteousness. Because we who come and are clothed go out into this world. And when we are clothed in righteousness, we are changed. Because righteousness and justice in the Greek language are the same word. And so when we are clothed with righteousness and holiness, we are clothed with God's justice. And so we leave this place seeking to share the justice of God, seeking to speak life into the unjust systems because God is clothing us this day. And if we embrace that, our world will be clothed in justice and righteousness. It's not easy to take off our old clothes but it's easy to ask God, clothe me in righteousness this day. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.